Um, so how many people really quickly ever have that reoccurring dream of where uh, you show up to school and uh, you're about to sit down in your chair and then you found out it's, it's actually the final exam and you haven't studied or prepared yet? So, so yeah, that's kind of how I feel right now, except imagine the teacher is the Nobel laureate in the field. That's your favorite field. And that's, that's a little bit what this is like. Um, so I'm just going to pull up some notes here, but I don't have, uh, don't have the same fun visual prompts. Um, no, in all sincerity, uh, thank you all for having me to here today. And thank you to Sandy and the Gladstone uh, family for hosting. Uh, this building has many remarkable scientists in it, and it's uh, through their kind of tireless effort that the sphere of human knowledge expands slowly each day. And having been someone at the bench, I know it takes about uh, 99 experiments of failure uh, before you have each one of success. And it's, it's a long and tireless process, uh, but it's really how society moves forward. So I appreciate all the work that they do, and, and it's really an honor to be here. Um, my first introduction to the stem cell biology for, field, I was more of an engineer by training, but it was really uh, Dr. Yamanaka's work in 2007 when he published his seminal paper in human cells uh, that caught my eye. I was like, oh, that seems like something that's going to be a pretty big deal. Maybe I should try to, maybe I should try to work on that and for this whole like, basic engineering thing. Uh, but at the same time, there was another researcher in Wisconsin named uh, uh, Thompson who published a a similar paper uh, at the exact same time in another journal, but with slightly different factors. So whereas uh, Dr. Yamanaka had four factors on a retrovirus, which is a specific backbone of virus that they were using to reprogram the cells, um, this other researcher was using a slightly different set of factors on a lentivirus. Uh, and this other researcher, uh, he had, Jamie Thompson, he had um, originally discovered and isolated the first human uh, embryonic stem cells in 1998. Uh, and so being a young scientist at the time, I was like, well, I've heard of this Jamie Thompson guy. I've never heard of this Shinya guy. I should just copy Jamie Thompson's work. Uh, and so for the next six months, I attempted to copy uh, Jamie Thompson's work uh, and was fraught by failure for six months, which I just thought was part of the process. Uh, until finally one day I tried uh, Dr. Yamanaka's method, and it worked the first time I tried it. Um, and so I learned my lesson, and now I'm just going to copy uh, Dr. Yamanaka's work from, from now on. Uh, and, uh, and so then, uh, then we were off to do the actual science. Uh, we had just replicated the work, and uh, we started using the technique to research a variety of different diseases. So we started in a few early childhood developmental diseases and eventually started working on uh, Parkinson's disease as well. Uh, and we published a few papers in that field looking at taking cells from genetically defined Parkinson patients. So this is a small subset of patients that have a genetic mutation that converges uh, some type of uh, risk for, for developing the disease. And we weren't exactly sure how it worked. So we'd gather their, stem, their skin cells and then turn them into pluripotent stem cells and then turn those cells into the type of brain cells that were dying from the disease called dopaminergic neurons. And we used that as a platform to study the disease and then with the idea of hopefully as uh, Sandy and Shinya had talked about before, using that as a platform to discover new drugs. Uh, over the last five years, I've, I've been in, uh, on the evil capitalist side of the world, uh, but I've also been taking, I call them soul supplements, by continuing to do a little bit of research uh, at Stanford. And I published my most recent paper in July on using IPS and dopaminergic neurons and also transfecting, transfecting them with an optogenetic channel. So this is a light-activated ion channel. So you can shine a specific wavelength of light on the cell, and it turns it on. So you can just blast it at a certain frequency, and the cell just turns on. And then you can trans, and what we did was we took those cells from a human Parkinson disease patient and transplanted them into the brain of a rat. And then we run a fiber optic cable through the back of the rat's head, and we can use that cable to turn on and off the human cells in the animal's brain and then start studying of how these human neurons integrate into the host brain. Uh, and so that was the first really foray into the power of that stem cells have in a therapeutic capacity. Now, this is very far from actually wanting to put any of these in humans. Uh, we're not like gonna be transplanting these in and running fiber optic cables anytime soon. Uh, the cells don't 
integrate into the native network as beautifully as the human or as the brain does when it develops. They're this bolus of cells and they kind of shoot tangles. There are axons everywhere. Um, but it gave you a sense of like, wow, these are human cells that we're transplanting into a rat and it actually does something. It integrates and we can turn on these cells and watch how the rest of the animal's brain performs. This is something that's much more sophisticated in response than what we've ever done before. Um, and so I want to put like a disclaimer on what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the challenges that face stem cell therapy, because there are many, uh, and there's many challenges that we'll need to overcome, but we will overcome them. And so instead, it's the question of why should we do this if it's going to be hard? Like Why do the hard thing? Uh, and what is the promise of stem cells that uh, our existing techniques don't promise before. So you can think about, we already have, we already have many types of drugs. Uh, this first small molecules were really developed by Ian Fleming in the early 1920s, but it wasn't until the kind of progress in synthetic organic chemistry that allowed us to produce that uh, penicillin at scale. And that took an, another 15 years. Likewise, we moved from small molecules to larger molecules, proteins, uh, and we've first started using proteins to treat people also in the, in the early 20s. We would ground up cow pancreases and isolate insulin and deliver that to diabetic patients. But it wasn't until you know, some of the researchers right next door here and at Stanford, uh, Herb Boyer and Stanley Cohen's work on recombinant DNA that we were able to tune proteins to exactly what we would want to treat human disease. Likewise, with cell therapy, We've actually kind of been doing cell therapy in some ways for a while. We've uh, been doing transplants, bone marrow transplants, blood transfusions for, uh, for decades, but we just haven't really had the tools or the knowledge that we could shift these cells in a way that uh, we could tune them to treat a specific disease that we were interested in. Uh, so then the next response is like, well, what, uh, what can we do with that? Uh, why work on these stem cells uh, if they're so much harder to work with than just a small molecule, some chemical that we uh, bake up in the laboratory or a, a protein that we just have a bacteria produce for us. Uh, and the reason is because cells have something that none of these other molecules do. Uh, cells have logic embedded into them. Uh, they have an ability to respond to their environment, integrate that response, and come up with their, their own their own intervention on, on, on our behalf. So if you take the standard of care, for example, in, in diabetes right now, is a patient has to monitor their own glucose levels by taking a blood prick and then inject themselves with insulin. Uh, we're kind of relying on them for this feedback cycle. If you take the, <clears throat> the cell therapy approach to that, it would be we put a cell into the body or engineer endogenous cells, the cells that already reside in the patient's body, to monitor the blood glucose levels themselves and say, okay, the blood glucose levels get above 100 milligrams per deciliter, then now suddenly create insulin and secrete it out of the cell. And the cell just does that for us. That's what our cells in our pancreas already do for us right now. Um, we could never design a drug that had that exact same effect with that amount of logic built in. Uh, you can, that's a, even a simpler case. Imagine one that's uh, even more extreme. As uh, Sandy mentioned earlier, there's uh, many different types of cells that are already in us. So we all brought adult stem cells here with us today, not in our, not in our pockets, but residing throughout, residing throughout our body. So we have hemopoietic stem cells that reside in the long bones of our body, and they give rise to our blood and immune system. Uh, but what happens when a something goes wrong. Right now we've developed a number of different drugs to target diseases of the blood and immune system, but they can have just one specific effect. We put the drug into the patient uh, and there's a giant bolus spike of that drug and maybe every morning a patient takes that drug and it just has that effect and then it peters off over time, has an effect, peters off over time. It's a pretty crude way of actually trying to treat a disease. Uh, in a hemopoietic system, you can imagine either taking new hemopoietic stem cells, kind of fresh ones, and, all, um, and or you could uh, induce the endogenous ones and fix them somehow so that they respond to the problem themselves. Uh, and if your body's not making enough white blood cells, they detect that and then start making more white blood cells for you. If they're not, your body's not making enough red blood cells, they detect that and make it for you. It's a level of sophistication that we would never be able to achieve with small molecules and proteins on their own. And that's really, when you cut down to the basis of it, 
because they have logic built into the cell. And so for us computer nerds, that sounds awesome, right? That's, uh, that's basically the operating system for engineering human biology. So for the first time ever, we can start thinking of much more sophisticated interventions than we were able to do before, which means we can treat and cure diseases that we were never able to cure before. Uh, if you think about the difference between delivering a drug over time versus a bone marrow transplant is one is a sequential series of treatments basically indefinitely, uh, and the other is a one-time or a three-time injection of some cells that then do the work themselves uh, for, for eternity after that. Um, the other advantage of these of thinking about cells as a logic gates is we can start to think about things that biology doesn't even do yet. Uh, so not only can we cure diseases as they arise, but we can start thinking about a prevention of disease before it arises. Um, and we don't even have to get too exotic in our, in our philosophizing about it, because we already know some circuits that we would like to target. Uh, there's a huge amount of variability between everyone in this room and everyone in the world. We respond to the development of diseases in different ways, and we develop diseases in different ways. Uh, some of us are more prone to some diseases or less prone to the others. Uh, and we can find out what's unique uh, and special in those gain of loss or functions in, in some people and, and deliver it in a way of engineering and programming someone else to, to have that similar effect. Um, so that could either look like uh, variants of PCSK9, so you can reduce cholesterol levels in people, so you, no longer would you ever have to take a statin. You just naturally have lo much lower cholesterol levels and thus massively reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we could also engineer in the ability to detect cancer cells arising in the body much earlier before they turn into large tumors that are then difficult to treat. Uh, and all this sounds, you might be like, oh, Blake, this sounds totally crazy. What are you talking about? Uh, but in some ways, we're already doing some of these things. So like we said about hemopoietic stem cells, we already have been doing hemopoietic stem cell transplants since the 1950s. There's lots of problems with them, graft-versus-host diseases, et cetera, but they're problems that we will be able to overcome, and it will massively expand the set of diseases that we're able to treat with that therapy. If you think about hemopoietic stem cells themselves, it's not a complicated uh, process to even transplant. Your hemopoietic stem cells that arise in your body, about 10% of them every day bud off from your bone marrow and migrate around and reconnect in your bone marrow somewhere else. So it's a very easy, relatively easy transplant. You just inject them in. They know where to go. They home to the right endogenous niche. And then they start replicating themselves. Just a handful, of, a small number of hemopoietic stem cells can reconstitute and repopulate your entire blood and bone marrow system on their own. Uh, on the cancer side, we're starting to do that in a way that Sandy and Dr. Yamanaka described as well, where we can take cells out of the body and kind of train them to look for cancer and put them back in. Uh, and then they go and hunt for those cancer cells and, and eradicate them. Uh, this work is, is being done by many labs. There's uh, a number of companies now that are public companies uh, that are valued in the billions, which gets uh, capitalists like me very excited. Um, and, and it's just the beginning of a new field on, on, on the cancer side. Uh, so you, even though it sounds kind of fantastical, uh, we're gonna like take these cells and engineer them up and have logic gates in them and oh, operating system, this all sounds like uh, uh, reasoning by analogy and it must be completely crazy. Uh, we've, we've been doing some forms of it for decades and other forms of it relatively recently with great success. And so uh, in some ways the way that we saw small molecules took more than a decade before we could develop synthetic organic chemistry to make it broadly applicable and engineered. Uh, and then recombinant DNA for engineering proteins took multiple decades from using the first human insulin to now the variety of different biological molecules we have treating human disease. It's really been in the last 10 years where we've had the techniques for engineering and tailoring cells that we've never had before. And Dr. Yamanaka and Dr. Sherry Stava, who are here in the front, are some of the pioneers of that field, both in reprogramming somatic cells, as adult cells to pluripotent cells, as well as adult cells to other types of adult cells or other types of adult stem cells that 
we might be interested in using to treat the disease. Uh, and so the, kind of the conclusion of that is there's going to be lots of stuff that's difficult about this process. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. So that means we should try to do it, and that's the exact reason that, uh, that we're excited to, to be working in the field and very actively looking at, at companies in this general field of you know, stem cells attempting to cure disease. Uh, I should say that uh, Dr. Yamanaka told, uh, told a story about his dad, and uh, so I was thinking there, sitting there thinking, well, my dad's in the audience. I better tell a story about my dad, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I think I have better hair than him, so I can't use the same joke. Uh, but um, but my, my uh, dad moved to uh, San Francisco. Uh, I should also mention that my, my family's there, my brother and my mom and my cousin as well. Uh, and I and I yeah, and I definitely wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the both of them raising me. But um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I feel extremely lucky to to be raising this family. But uh, it, the specific story here is uh, when my dad was living in San Francisco in the, in the 70s. Genentech was actually incubated uh, basically out of his apartment. Uh, his roommate uh, started Genentech while they were living together. And I was like, God, that's such a cool story. Uh, and I don't want to be telling your stories as my cool story. So I got to develop the next cell therapy company so I have my own cool story. I don't have to be regurgitating your story at podiums all the time. Um, so a, a less sentimental one, but a, but a true one all, nonetheless. So thank you. <laughs>